Jerusalem, city of conflict, hope, and peace, is a subject of vital importance to not only you and I, but to the whole world, because the destiny of Jerusalem is going to change the world that we live in and as we know it today. And the destiny of Jerusalem has already been foretold and predetermined by the creator of heaven and earth, and he's revealed it destiny in his holy word of truth. Much of what we read tonight in that chapter is the future of what lays ahead for Jerusalem. So when we look at Jerusalem today, it is indeed a city of conflict. It is one of the oldest cities in the world, and it has been the focal point of Middle East and world unrest for thousands of years. And in recent history, we have seen that unrest, it's intensified ever since the Jews returned to the land and were declared a nation in 1948. So why does this tiny nation and this small city of Jerusalem draw so much attention from the nations of the world? And why is there so much violence and unrest over events that take place in Israel and Jerusalem? Well, one of the reasons that uh, we may be able to discern by observation, even if we aren't Bible students, is the fact that three major world religions all converge on this city. We have the Jews, we have the Muslims, and we have the Christians. And they all revere it as a sacred city and a place of worship. The Jews, of course, made Jerusalem their capital city. And they consider it holy because it was once their holy city when King David conquered it and established Israel as a powerful kingdom. And it was the site of their ancient temple, actually three temples that were built. And today they still worship at the remaining stones of the western wall of the last temple, which was called Herod's temple. The Muslims, of course, they consider it a holy place because it connects this city with the prophet Muhammad from whom they derive their beliefs. And they have constructed what we know today as the Dome of the Rock on the very site of the ancient Jewish temple. And of course, the prophet Muhammad is the founder of Islam. And it's traditionally believed that the prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven from the site of the Dome of the Rock. And of course, we have the Christians. And Christians, of course, revere this holy city because because of its close association with the Lord Jesus Christ and his teachings. The city and the surrounding area is where many events took place in the life of the Lord Jesus, including his death and resurrection. So if we look at this next slide here for a minute, what we have today is we have the old city of Jerusalem, and it's divided into four quarters. If you go there today, it's, this is how the interior of the old uh, city is divided. You have a Jewish quarter, you have a Muslim quarter, you have a Christian quarter, and you have an Ar- Armenian quarter, which is basically a Christian quarter that has Christian sites within that area as well. And so we have what you might consider a melting pot of deep-seated emotions and diverse religions and beliefs all converging on the city of Jerusalem, all wanting to claim the city as their own and neither group willing to concede to the other. So of course, when you have that situation, you are going to have conflict. And because these are three world religions, the whole world is affected by what goes on in Jerusalem. Because the whole world has a vested interest in what takes place in Jerusalem and what the future of that city will be. So is it just coincidence that the whole world has a vested interest in this city? Or is it by the divine hand of the Creator that the fate of this city 
is of vital importance to the whole world. Well, friends, hopefully tonight we'll see that the Bible provides us with the answers to these questions. If we start by just looking at the name of Jerusalem itself, according to Smith's Bible Dictionary, the name Jerusalem means habitation of peace or city of peace. The very meaning of the name provides us with some insight as to what the future may have in store for this city from God's perspective. But the city today is anything but a city of peace. The world leaders today and the governments of today would have us believe that they are pushing for peace at all cost. And not only in regard to Israel, but throughout the world. But the reality paints a very different picture. Here's a recent slide from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. This is from April 24, 2023. Total global military expenditure increased by 3.7% in real terms in 2022 to reach a new high of $2,240 billion, or $2.24 trillion if you prefer. Military expenditure in Europe saw its steepest year-on-year -year increase in at least 30 years. The three largest spenders in 2022, United States, China, and Russia, accounted for 56% of the world total. And this article went on to say, by far the sharpest rise in spending, plus 13%, was seen in Europe and was largely accounted for by Russian and Ukrainian spending. However, military aid to Ukraine and concerns about a heightened threat from Russia strongly influenced many other states and their spending decisions, as did tensions in East Asia. And here's an observation I thought was pretty astute for this man. He says, the continuous rise in global military expenditure in recent years, because if you look at the trend, it's increased over the last 10 years uh, very quickly. The expenditures in recent years is a sign that we are living in an increasingly insecure world, said Dr. Nan Tian, senior research with Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, military expenditure and arms production program. So regardless of how well the intentions of some leaders may be to establish peace, the reality is the world is preparing for war. And as we can see from the slide, tensions have increased rapidly since Russia has invaded Ukraine. Well, to Bible students, this is no surprise. This is just the beginning of what Russia intends to do. The Bible prophecy speaks about what Russia will do in the last days. And it describes them as the king of the north. And it clearly shows that Russia and a confederacy of nations will eventually invade Israel and Jerusalem in an attempt to dominate the world under its control. This invasion is prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 38 as well as other places. And it's not our subject tonight, but if it's something that interests you, we will be dealing with that subject later on in the year at the end of November. But what we're witnessing today, friends, is no coincidence. God is in control of what takes place in the world. And the nations will respond to circumstances and events in the world to fulfill God's will and purpose without even being aware of it. Now consider the words that we read today in uh, Zechariah chapter 14. We read there in Zechariah 14, verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. 
and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in, cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half towards the south. Here is a picture of the future of Jerusalem. It will involve an unimaginable holocaust of war which will necessitate the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who's described here in verse 4 whose feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And that's the very place that the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. And it will cause that mountain to split into two. There'll be a great earthquake. And the rest of the chapter, you can see that there'll be other geographical changes in the land. And, it, and Jerusalem, as we see it today, will be actually lifted up to a higher level than what we see today when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Now last week, if you were with us, we considered the fact that Israel as a nation today is a witness that God exists. The very fact that the Jews are in the land of Israel and established as a nation today is a miracle in itself, only made possible by God's divine providence. And if we consider the Jews just from, say, the time of the Lord Jesus Christ till today, uh, we, uh, when we consider what the Lord Jesus Christ said about their history, the judgments that would come on Jerusalem by the Romans shortly after his death and resurrection, we see how accurate the Bible really is. The Lord Jesus Christ said in Luke 21, verse 20, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh, and let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck, in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well that is exactly what took place in AD seventy. The Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem and scattered the Jews, forcing them to live in other places throughout the world. It was one of the most terrible sieges ever conducted on a city. And it was because the Jews had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They cried out, his blood be upon us and upon our children. And of course, this was one of the punishments that God brought upon that city. But over the course of almost 2,000 years, the Jews managed to keep their identity in the lands that they had been scattered. And of course, gradually, following World War I, they began to return to the land of Israel. And following World War II, there was even a greater return, and they were declared a nation again in 1948. Coincidence? Well, it's not coincidence if we read God's word. Because not only was the scattering of Israel foretold, but the regathering of Israel was foretold. Consider the words of Jeremiah in chapter 30, verses 2 and 3. Jeremiah says, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. 
For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. That's exactly the state that we find Israel in today. Yes, they once again are a nation in their own land. But they live in a state of fear, surrounded by nations and a world that is preparing for war. Now we want to back up in history and take a closer look at this phrase that is used here in verse 3 where it says, I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers. Because by looking at this phrase, it will help us to see why God has such an interest with this people Israel and the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. So we're going to have a little bit of repeat from what we looked at last week, but repeat is always good. So we're going to go back to the promise made to the man Abram, whose name God later changed to Abraham, and whose name actually means a father of a multitude. So in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, we read, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, Abram, shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so God promised a land to Abraham, a land that he would show him. It was a land that God had chosen. And God promised that he would make Abram a great nation in verse 2. And that through him, all nations of the earth would be blessed. So not just the Jews, but Jews and Gentiles, all nations of the earth would be blessed. Here in this promise that God made to Abraham, we not only have the basis of the gospel message for the whole world, but it also provides us with greater insight insight as to what the future holds for the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. The nation of Israel originated from Abraham. Abraham had a son Isaac, and Isaac had a son Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. And the fact that as a people, Israel has been preserved throughout history is not only a witness that God exists, but it's also a witness to the fact that God in the very near future will fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham. Because the Bible clearly tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham never received the promise. It says that he obtained a good report through faith and he died in faith not having received the promise. So it's yet to be fulfilled in the future, this promise to Abram. And when Abraham finally arrived in this land that God told him to go to, that he would be shown, we read in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14, the Lord said unto Abram, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Abraham and his seed would inherit the land forever. Not just for a limited time. This promise was something that he would inherit forever. And if there was any doubt as to what the land God was talking about, it's identified for us in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18, where we read, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And of course, between those two rivers is the area of Israel that we know today. The river of Egypt being the Nile, we will see that the land promised to Abraham is actually greater than what Israel possesses today. 
And the only way that Abraham can receive this promise is by a physical resurrection and the blessing of life everlasting. And the wonderful part about that, friends, is God, as part of his plan and purpose, has offered the same hope to all those that will respond in faith to his gracious offer of salvation. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians provides us some some wonderful details about the promise made to Abraham here. And this is probably a good one to look up in your Bibles. I've included all these slides for convenience, but it's always good to look these things up in your own Bibles or at very least write these passages down so that you can go home and look them up and study them for yourself. But in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Apostle Paul gives us some wonderful insights here. In verse 8 of chapter 3, it says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, or the nations, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And that's what we looked at back in Genesis chapter 12. And then in verse 16, we have some further detail. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, And to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. And then he concludes this chapter in verse 26, and he says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So we see in verse 8 that the gospel was preached unto Abraham, and the gospel is what Jesus preached. It was the good news of the kingdom of God on earth and the name of Jesus Christ. And in verse 16, we see that that seed that we saw in the promise made to Abraham pointed forward and spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then in verse 26 to 29, we see that by responding in faith to the waters of baptism which is really a symbolic death and resurrection that identifies ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, by partaking to baptism, we see how we ourselves can become heirs of the very same promise that God made to Abraham. We have hope of everlasting life and an inheritance in the promised land. No wonder it's the gospel message, the wonderful good news. If we make that commitment, we wait in faith and hope, like Abraham, of a time when Abraham and Christ and all those who have embraced the hope of the gospel down through the ages will, by God's grace, receive eternal life in a place in God's kingdom which will fill the whole earth, but it will be centered on the land of Israel and the holy city of Jerusalem. And this is what God had intended for his people Israel from the very beginning when he brought them out of the land of Egypt by the hand of Moses. If we, if we look back in time to the time of Moses in, and we look at the uh, book of Deuteronomy in chapter 7 and verse 6, we read this. Moses says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, their fathers being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, 
which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generation. You see, God's promises are sure. They will be fulfilled. They're not like the false promises of men that men can't keep. God's promises are sure, and they will take place. How do we know, then, that Jerusalem is the city that God has chosen for the Lord Jesus Christ to rule from? Well, again, if we, if we look at the history of the Jews, and we follow their history from this time when Moses had led them out of Egypt into the wilderness, and they're just about to go into the Promised Land, under the leadership of Joshua, the children of Israel were led into the land of Israel, the place that God had chosen, as we've already seen, and they were established as a nation there under the leadership of King David. And King David, he subdued all the nations around Israel at that time, and David ruled over the kingdom of Israel from Jerusalem. And again, this was the place that God had shown David that he would establish a house of worship because David wanted to establish a temple that God might be worshipped in. And so God not only showed him the place of Jerusalem, but he provided him with the template of how that temple should be constructed. And it was at this time that God made another promise, and this time it was to King David. And we read about that in 2 Samuel 7, of verse 12, where we read, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, in other words, after thou art passed away, David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, speaking of the temple, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, speaking of the very first king of Israel, whom I put away before thee. And then he says, David, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. The kingdom would be established forever. The throne would be established forever. And again, this promise has not yet been fulfilled. There was a partial fulfillment. A temple was built by his son Solomon, but the kingdom that is talked about here is to take place before David. In other words, again, it involves resurrection and the granting of everlasting life. And David will see his throne established before his eyes. And when this kingdom is established, it will be forever. And consider the words in Psalm 132. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set up thy throne. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. And Zion is, is an, another name for Jerusalem and the surrounding area in the future. When we spoke about it being lifted up. So Zion is like Jerusalem. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. And then we read... Um, about Saul, uh, David, David's son Solomon in First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 23, we read, Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father, and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. This was a time of peace, and it's referred to as the throne of the Lord. There's no other kingdom that's ever described as being the throne of the Lord. This was God's place that he had chosen and of course the kingdom went into decline when at the end of Solomon's life they had turned to idolatry and done all types of wicked things that God had told him not to do and in 1 Kings eleven thirty six, this is speaking about 
one of Solomon's son, because the kingdom would be divided. Ten tribes would go to the north. They would be referred to Israel. Two tribes would stay in the south. They would be under the kingship of Rehoboam. And this is what is said to, about Rehoboam. And unto his son will I give, or Solomon's son, Rehoboam, I will give one tribe that David my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And so there's no doubt that it is God who has chosen Jerusalem as his holy city. And all the nations today that are claiming it as their own and fighting and struggling over, it's futile. Because God, it's God's land, it's God's city, God has chosen Israel and his land and Jerusalem as his holy city. And if we turn back to the prophet Zechariah and we look at chapter 12, just a couple of chapters before the one we had read, this is how we see Jerusalem today. In Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 2, we read, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And this is talking about the time that, that we see approaching. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. The fact that the nations are preparing to make war against it is by the divine plan and purpose of God that at Christ's return to the earth, he might pour out his righteous judgments on all those who have rebelled against him and refused his gracious offer of salvation through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It will indeed be the Lord Jesus Christ who will sit on the throne of his father David, ruling from Jerusalem. You may recall the words of the angel that he spoke to Mary when the Lord Jesus was born. They're recorded in Luke chapter 1 and in verse 30. We read, And the angel said unto her, speaking of Mary, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Jacob is another name for Israel. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So we can see how clearly God lays out his word for those who are seeking for truth and for seeking about the plan and purpose that God has with this earth and mankind and the future that is in store for Israel and Jerusalem. These are very clear scriptures that anybody can see when they look, read God's word and put together some of the pieces that he's left on record for our benefit. And from all the signs that we're witnessing today, the world is shortly going to witness the return of Christ in all his power and all his glory. The first mission of the Lord Jesus Christ was to come as a sacrificial lamb to take away the sin of the world. When John the Baptist saw the Lord, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And all those who believe on him and are baptized into his saving name have hope of everlasting life in the kingdom of God. But when he returns to the earth the second time, it will be very different. He's described as a lion from the tribe of Judah. And he will deliver Israel from the nations who have been gathered against it, just like we read in Zechariah chapter 14. And he will execute God's righteous judgments 
on this wicked and unjust world in which we live. And the Lord Jesus Christ will establish the kingdom of God on earth. And a new world order will be established at that time. Consider the words of the prophet Isaiah, where he says to us in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. That's speaking about a new temple that will be constructed when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And it will be on the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 18 we read, But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. What a wonderful vision of what lays in store for the city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah says in chapter 3 and verse 17, that at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. There will be no provision for war in the age to come. Christ will ensure that. And what we have here is a depiction of the temple that's described to us in Ezekiel's prophecy and this is the temple that will be constructed under the kingship and rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be one mile square and it will be in that portion when Jerusalem is lifted up and that mountain is there. This will be at the top. No wonder it will be a glory for the whole world. Christ is to reign from Jerusalem over a world at peace. The signs that we see today, friends, are indicators that the Lord's return is not far off. And it's our appeal to you to learn more of God's purpose, to embrace the gospel message of salvation, and accept Christ into your life by submitting to the waters of baptism. And I'll leave you with one last slide. And these are the words that the Apostle Paul spoke to the men of Athens in his day. And it was an appeal and it was a warning. The Apostle says this in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because you see, the Heavenly Father has provided all things necessary for man's salvation even to the giving of his only begotten son. So now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because the apostle say, says, he, that is God, hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he has raised him from the dead. Even so come, Lord Jesus.